without further ado, uh, I would like to invite Professor Christian Chokan to present his uh, coming from the University of Bucharest as a, as a professor and researcher. And he's also, as we all know, the current president of the Central and East European Society for, Phen for Phenomenology. So please. Thank you, Andre. Um, so this uh, paper is a part of uh, an article that I uh, it's in on the, it will be published, I hope, in the last in the next uh, month, maybe at the end of the year, in a uh, volume uh, on testimony on the phenomenology of testimony, edited by Gert uh, Jan van der Heiden uh, at Brill, and uh, it's the uh, it's a topic. It's uh, the question of testimony, but. Uh, more specifically, the temporal dimension of the experience of witnessing and testimony. So the correlation between testimony and witnessing. So uh, the questions I will start uh, are the following. Is there any particular modernization of the future, of the present, and the past that arises in the existential context of witnessing and testimony? How the expectation or the recollection the anticipation or the reminiscence, the pretension of the immediate future and the, or the retention of the immediate past are constituted in this experience of witnessing <coughs> and testimony. What kind of presence of the present is revealed in this very special situation? What kind of now shows itself in such context our existence? Emphasizing the correlation of witnessing and testimony means that we must not focus exclusively our attention on the discursive moment, the one in which the subject actually bears witness before others in delivering one's testimony. This discursive moment must be integrated into the constitutive, constitutive genesis from which it arises. Thus, we have to envision the whole experiential context of which this discursive moment is only a part, an entire process where the discourse occurs only in its final phase. The phenomenon as a whole must therefore be understood as the articulation of several constitutive moments as a progression that grows and develops during several phases until it reaches its fulfillment in the discursive moment. So this phenomenon is constituted between a primary moment when the subject, the subject becomes witness in front of an essentially disturbing event, what we can call being instituted as a witness presence, and the final moment in which the witness testifies before others as a witness speech. Thus, becoming witness and testifying should be seen as two distinctive constitutive moments belonging to one and the same encompassing phenomenon. We must also bear in mind that between these two constitutive moments, we also have in between an intermediate moment, a complicated phase of rumination. In this middle phase, the self who has become a witness not only attempts to assimilate the experience it went through, existentially struggling in relation to the traces of its own past, but puts before itself or ahead of itself in a futural sense the possibility of bearing witness before others regarding this shattering event. The phenomenon of witnessing is therefore essentially related to this in-between, constituting itself in the tension that gathers together the three essential moments, becoming witness as witness presence, rumination, and bearing witness as witness speech. This in-between engages the temporality from one end to another, and this on several levels, in relation to the self with itself, in relation to the self with the others, and in relation to the self with the surrounding world as such. Let's focus first on the first moment, the beginning witness. What kind of temporalization is at play here? Here we can say that the subject suddenly becomes a witness. It is forcibly and abruptly drawn in the situation that institutes a subject as a witness. The self is seized against its will in spite of itself being captured by the phenomenological power of the event, 
Of course, this existential grip must be analyzed in relation to what precedes it, in this case, in contrast to its immediate past. Therefore, the first experiential articulation concerns this tra transition, this leap, this rupture, for there are two clearly distinct temporal levels at play, a striking separation between a before and an after. Before the eruption of the event that institutes the subject as a witness, the dominant style of temporalization is that specific to everyday existence, the average way of living in the horizon of concern. The fact of becoming witness must be therefore un understood in relation to the everybody, uh, everyday temporalization from which the subject is suddenly dislocated. In everyday life, we usually go about our business having plans, pursuing this or that goal, being caught in the practical sphere of action in the common world of concern. In contrast to life lived in this, at this everyday level, the subject finds itself suddenly thrown into an overwhelming situation. It is this situation that institutes the subject to dress through this being thrown as an experiential witness caught up in the tremendous presence as a witness of an excessive event. We are dealing then with this first rupture between the everyday temporality that precedes the situation of becoming witness and the temporality that is proper to this existential becoming, becoming witness as such. Regarding the before, we can take, of course, Heidegger as a guide. We recall that in Sein und Zeit, he interprets the, the everyday, everydayness, starting from the basic fact that the Dasein is absorbed in concern, in preoccupation. In the horizon of concern, the temporization of Dasein aims at what can be used, handled, produced, obtained in relation to inner-worldly entities given as, as tools. Dasein's future is an awaiting that can be made present for, in the form of procuring, obtaining, or doing. Thus, the present is understood in the form of making present. This everyday concern is characterized by an originary temporization, but it's still an inauthentic one because Dasein understands itself in terms of those entities with which it is concerned. It does not consider itself starting from itself, but, and, but ignores itself or uh, has it in the form of self-forgetfulness. Such a daily temporalization is brutally interrupted by the fact of becoming witness when the self is su suddenly seized by the event, being somehow captivated by the phenomenological power of the overwhelming occurrence. The subject's self cannot resist this power. In fact, it, it does not, the, the witness does not choose by, vir by virtue of one's own I can to become a witness. Um, it, it, so it's not his decision, it's not one's own decision. Instead, faced with the overwhelming event, seized by it, the subject becomes a witness in spite of itself, submitting to it from the very beginning. It is existentially disturbed, losing its autonomy as a subject in the world. The, the self can no longer concern itself with its worldly projects, with acquiring something or undertaking something. We are dealing with an existential disruption that has a particular temporal meaning. When the self is captured by the phenomenal aura of the event being caught under its domineering force and becoming its witness, the making present of the concern is definitely suspended. The subject can no longer deal with the usual things it was doing before the occurrence of the event. It is simply riveted to the event. But neither can the future be constituted as usual in the forms of various expectations or anticipations. In Husserlian terms, we can say that the pretension is somehow suspended, even if the retention can still shed some light on the difference between the two styles of temporalization, between before and now, between the everyday concern of earlier and the perplexity in front of the current overwhelming situation. As for the present, <coughs> it is a one of an overpowered passivity, not of action. As I said, the subject does not institute itself as a witness, exerting its own power in active self-affirmation of the ego. Instead, it is instituted as a, uh, as a witness and it passively endures this institution which radicali radically modifies its way of being. 
The temporal articulation that is manifested here must be understood as a tension between a past that is suspended because what the subject was doing before is now irrelevant and an unclear or indeterminate future that is not yet given because it cannot be, cannot be yet anticipated. The self also finds itself cut off from the common world. It is thrown as in a kind of abyss hovering between that common world already was lost and one's own world not yet found. It is as if being held in limbo. For the moment, the self still doesn't really understand what is happening. The event is, by definition, unpredictable, unforeseeable, unexpected, unanticipated. It is as if the entire experiential context evades its ordinary possibility of temporalization. For in the everyday mode of temporalization, we follow something that is unfolding from an already given situation, and it is only through this tension between an anticipated future and the having been we take over that we can finally release a present. However, the event that summons us to be its witness is radically different from everything that can be anticipated and foreseen, announced or perceived in advance. Consequently, everything that could be anticipated is placed in an every ty everyday time of concern in a linear temporality of what is awaited or to be expected. But the event, precisely by its eventfulness, evades this linear temporality. I have suggested that the subject finds itself as thrown in the situation of becoming witness, already captured into that overwhelming witness situation. We know that in Heidegger's terms, thrownness, Gewürfenheit, corresponds to one's essential past, always to be taken over in view of a project. But when the self is seized under the dominance of a tremendous event, it cannot take over this too charged thrownness. The self is anchored in what is given, chained in his throne situation, riveted to it. A vague opening to a future will eventually become possible, but only following the gradual distancing from this initial phase. In other words, following the initial phase in which the self finds itself as thrown in the situation of being overwhelmed, there is a peculiar moment in which the overpowering character of the event seems to gradually fade, and thus the subject becomes able to slowly det detach itself from it, evolving towards the next phase of rumination. Only then can a future horizon of bearing witness be glimpsed as a possibility. Only the gradual escape from the phenomenal aura of the terrible event will allow the subject to foreshadow a future. In any case, the situation of becoming witness must be seen in all its irreducible complexity. With respect to the self-understanding, the subject is totally stunned. It cannot actually grasp what is happening and is still incapable of projecting anything. Effectively, it is overwhelmed. It is, in any case, beyond fear, but caught in a feverish trembling. Discursively, the subject is mute, for discourse can no longer articulate the significance of the surrounding world. Meanings are deficient in the excessive presence of the event. Even if it still seems to be speaking, the subject can no longer grasp, grasp with words what is going on, being somehow caught in the muteness of the unspeakable. The self finds itself as if after a revelation that leaves it literally speechless. Bodily, the self is resigned to the limits of its one own I can. It is at the end of its powers, and it can no longer deploy the initiative of its own possibilities. Intersubjectively, the self is insulated, isolated, alone, because the event removes the self from the sociality of being together, tearing it out from the togetherness that grounds the various concrete possibilities of mutual collaboration in the horizon of concern. Let us now turn to the second moment of the experience, the rumination. Here, the subject starts to reappropriate itself after passing through the tumultuous event. If the first structural moment revolves around the fact of becoming witness, 
The second is constituted around the discovery of the fact that of already having been a witness. This fact of already having been a witness is ineffaceable and unforgettable. And the impossibility of forgetting generates, generates an incessant turmoil of memory, which is constantly activated. I was there becomes the expression of an obsession that gives me no rest. I am haunted by my having been a witness, which I cannot forget. I cannot consign what I have lived to a settled past. I cannot bring that to a closure. On the contrary, this turbulent experience of the event shows itself as a kind of past still open to the present, as a still open wound which can, continues to summon me, giving me no peace. Thus, in this second structural moment of experience, the self rediscovers itself. Here, the witnessing self confronts itself, trying to assimilate the unassimilable experience it has passed through. The self constantly returns to, that, to this past that gives no, uh, give, that give it no pe any peace, to this past that continues to obsess the witness in the present. The rec rec recurrence of this return to the past of the having been a witness marks the specificity of this second phase of rumination in its obsessive circularity. The witness faces itself, its past and its future, struggling within itself in this obsessional present. Before the question of bearing witness in front of others can arise, the witness must first of all bear witness to itself regarding the event it, it went through. The witness must first enter into a proto-dialogue with itself. The self must be its own first witness, elucidating its own experience to itself. And in a pre-discursive way, the self must confront itself in its own internal forum before it can appear in the external forum under the scrutiny of others. Therefore, if we ask how the subject enters the second phase of the experience of witnessing, that of rumination, the key lies precisely in this attempt to become aware of oneself as having been a witness in the difficult confrontation with this past that is obsessive, obsessively encroaching on the present. The self-awareness that was unsettled in the first instance is gradually reconstituted in the second phase in which the subject tries progressively to regain itself and to reconstruct the meaning of what happened. Dominant is, of course, the past, the past experience of the event. However, it is difficult to talk about past. Even though the event obsesses and haunts me, can I actually remember it? What exactly do I remember and how exactly do I remember? Am, not, am I not faced here with the impossibility of fully assimilating the past? Nevertheless, the past presses on, even if I cannot yet properly assimilate it, even if this past somehow remains refract refractory of being captured in the web of my recollection, opposing a kind of resistance to my tendency to remember it and to stabilize it in the vast palace of memory. Indeed, how to remember that which, by its excessive character, defies the possibilities of recollection? An inner proto-narrative is somehow necessary. What must first take, take, take place is a proto-discourse of the self with itself in an intermediate zone situated between the mute experience and the actual discourse. The subject detaches itself from the raw experience, withdraws from the wild lived experience of the event, falls back on itself, trying to recover its own voice to regain its words. The unforgettable character of the past summons me to take a stand regarding it. It solicits me and troubles me. But above all, I am concerned about the future that lies in front of me. Am I going to bear witness or not? Will I say what needs to be said or I, will I remain silent? But how could I say what seems unspeakable? In what way is the future constituted a future I still do not know how to anticipate, how to wait for, or how to project myself toward? 
in the second, in that second phase of rumination, the subject does not wait for something external to itself, does not project itself onto something outside itself, as in the project that involves entities within the world, but first of uh, all projects itself onto itself in the expectation of elucidation of itself by itself. So in that phase of rumination, the subject is still in a kind of twilight, in an existential fog, in which it fumbles in search of itself. The present consists precisely in this state of indeterminate indecision in which deliberation may eventually occur. In any case, in the in-between phase of rumination, there may be an incipient illumination of the experience turmoil, a gradual ordering of the existential chaos. But indecision still dominates here, as well as the uncertainty about what has been experienced and, above all, about what is to come. I still don't know what to say, what I have to say, and how to say what has to be said in some way. Thus, the relation with oneself in this phase revolves around the possibility of self-recovering, of regaining one's own self, but it is still caught in a diffuse halo of confusion. The relation with others is still privatively marked by loneliness, for encountering others can take place if it is going to take place only in the next phase of the experience with a passing from rumination into discourse. The temporalization is limited to the realm of one's own world, for the share world, the midwelt, in which the other can appear to me is not yet intended. Hence, the other's temporalization as a projection of the other on myself does not yet make its presence felt in my own world. For now, the self still remains withdrawn from the common world, trying, as I said, not only to come to its senses, to come back to its, uh, only to come to its senses and to come back to itself. For now, speech remains under restraint, held back in this transition from the mutism of the first phase to the silence of the second phase. After the turmoil of the previous phase, things begin to return in a, into a sort of equilibrium. The common world is still out there at some distance from the self's own space, self's, self's welt, and the self is still asking itself how to deal with it. It will be able to do it, of course, in the form of bearing witness, thus moving on the next structural moment of the phenomenology of witnessing. Thus, if the self runs ahead toward regaining its words, it makes the transition to the active experience of bearing witness. Here, the subject is finally revealed as witness speech. What kind of experience, of temporal experience, occurs in this context? The whole situation is linked to the dimension of intersubjectivity, which was only privatively foreshadowed in the, past, in the previous phases. Passing through the intermediate stage of quasi-solipsistic rumination, the witness thus emerges from solitude, from solitude, gradually opening itself to the horizon of others. In the attempt to speak in the world of others, however, the witness is still marked by the tremble of insecurity, because the self discovers a world that is somewhat unfamiliar, somehow known but still foreign. The self has been torn apart, torn from this common world by the excessive character of the event that instituted and singularized it as a witness. But how does one get from witness presence through rumination to the assumption of speech? What makes the subject speak up and testify in front of others? Of course, the witness can simply be summoned before an authority. Yet, perhaps even prior to any exterior, external convocation, it is its own past, the excessive event that pushes the subject to speak a past manifested, manifesting itself as an existential burden that the subject is forced to discharge to speech, to, through speech. Regardless of whether we are talking about the obligation 
to bear witness, the duty to bear witness, the will to bear witness, the desire to bear witness, or bearing witness in spite of oneself without taking into account the privative variation, such as the inability to bear witness or the distrust in the act of bearing witness or the radical skepticism regarding speech as such. All these concrete possibilities may have specific temporal structure that I cannot, of course, analyze here. In any case, the temporal experience of the, of the witness is constituted by a self-projection in a futural sense toward, toward the world of others. It is a world, a world in which others can receive the witness or not, can listen the testimony or not, can believe it or not. The witness self-projection toward the world of others is accomplished starting from its having been, from its essential past, essential past by taking over the unsettling experience. This appropriation is finally possible only because the excessive givenness of the event has already passed through the process of sedimentation that occurred in the intermediate phase of rumination. The temporalization of the witness will therefore engage the potential intersubjective space. The self-projection of the witness is related to the possibility of reconstituting with the others a common world, a possible togetherness, a world to which the witness can once again belong. The situation should accordingly be seen from both perspectives. What is relevant is not only what kind of experience is constituted from the, per, from the perspective of the one who bears witness, but also what kind of experience is constituted from the perspective of the one who listens to it. Indeed, when the witness is a witness speech, thus being put in a position to bear witness in words before the other, others, we must differentiate between the experience of giving the testimony and the experience of receiving it. For both giving and receiving bring into play, each in its own way, a specific articulation of temporal ecstasies. In the encounter of the one who bears witness and the one who listens, each of them comes towards the other. The one who comes is futural by the very fact of coming, following the French wordplay of venir et avenir. It is charged with a future that is still inaccessible to the other. The witness does not have access to the experience of the listener. As a witness who gives testimony, I stand before the other as before the unknown whose experience is fundamentally inaccessible to me. I don't know if the other will believe me. My future is somehow in the hands of the other who stands before, before me like a sphinx and can, me, can tell me I believe you or I don't believe you. The one listening to my testimony will be able to take another step by telling me you have a place or you don't have a place through your bearing witness in our common world, in a world where we all are third parties in relation to each, each other, in which all the words, testimonies included, are mutually certified and evaluated in order, in, in order finally, to settle into, into truths accepted by all. Only there, in the common world, can the diachron diachrony of our divergent experience can pass into synchrony. Thus, on the futural path of temporalization, the one that engages anticipations and expectation, we can interrogate both perspectives that are in play. What exactly is awaiting the witness who is presenting the testimony? And at the same time, what exactly is expecting the one listening to it? When the witness is projecting itself onto others, beginning talk, to talk to them about the event that unsettled its own most self, it expects first of all to be believed. The witness comes with also with a promise of sincerity, and this promise also has a future structure, it's a promise. But what exactly does the one who receives the testimony expect? 
First of all, the listener expects to be told the truth. In this case, not to be lied to, not to be fooled, not to be deceived, misled or manipulated. Thus, we see that the two futurizations, these two ways of projecting the future, are placed on essentially different levels, that there is something fundamentally different at stake in each case. For the futurality of the one who listens to the testimony seems rather epistemically anchored, being effectively focused on what is said, the, the problem of knowledge, epistemic. Um, the, but the futural character or, of the one who bears witness is rather existentially anchored. The need to be believed, it is not primarily related to an exchange of information that may be true or false, but is related to the very being of the self that presents itself as a witness, putting itself as if naked before others. For in this space between giving and receiving the testimony, what is the stake is primarily the witnesses belonging to the common world. At stake is a preliminary, of course, a, a, a preliminary distrust that the witness, witness has to overcome if it wants to, that the testimony be accepted. So the testimony has to be credible. It has to convince. It has to come with a credit that gives credibility. But for the one who listens, one, what is credible is what can already be expected and what can be anticipated. Credibility is related to what is already known. Hence, the major difficulty lies in the fact that the unsettling and the excessive event, event that about the, which the testimony is, is not usually situated in the area of the credible, but on the contrary, in that of the incredible and unbelievable. Its exceptional character is therefore related to its paradoxical charge improbable, inconceivable, impossible, what the witness says in the testimony is presented to the one listening as something unacceptable from the start. Indeed, testimony, testimonies can be heard but not accepted, can be listened but not received. This is the case with Paul the Apostle addressing the philosopher in the Areopagus, but also with the Holocaust survivors who are not believed in the first years after liberation. The one who bears witness really needs to be believed by those who listen, because only in this way can the witness finally regain its own place in the common world. On the other hand, the one who listens to the testimony has no need to accept it as such, to the extent that the listener is already installed in a way that it is autochthonous and autarkic in a stable world, a world of already certified and attested things that are simply said. The coming of the witness, this stranger, before the others, is therefore never without tribulations. The witness speech, being still uncredited, but perhaps not discredited, is forced to engage in an intense work of witnessing in a travail de témoignage, someone somewhat similar to travail de deuil, therefore in a sustained effort of showing oneself in one's nakedness. Here, the fact of being taken at one's word is not at all guaranteed, although all that the witness has is the word. Yet, the one who listens to the testimony is never satisfied with the saying, le dire in Levinas, but bets everything on the said, on le dit, on what can be caught in the system with all other statements with, and what can be put in the coherence of a totality. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for this, this very thorough and very detailed uh, phenomenological account of, of what it means to, to, to bear witness. Um, and I open the floor for, for discussion let's say a couple of questions because we have to move on <laughs> so please uh, yeah okay uh, Dragan was first yeah. thank you Christian uh, 100 years ago one of the best writers in the world has died Franz Kafka 
And one of his professors was Hans Gross, the founder of uh, criminology. And in his manual for further criminologist, Hans Gross analyzed uh, the, his practical experiences related to bearing witness. And he was deeply unsatisfied. <coughs> he claimed that usual people are not capable uh, of bearing witness because they're uh, capable only uh, of judging. They're mostly judge. They're not uh, describing what happened in terms of of uh, you try to describe, but to be a judge, to play a role of the judge. That, that, that's something which we can somehow uh, uh, follow and accept. My question would be, how, uh, how does this conclusion or thesis fit into your lecture? Uh, I would say that uh, the person who judges is putting oneself in the front of the one who listens. And already, uh, instead of uh, being uh, uh, witness speech, a, a witness is a, uh, it's projecting oneself on the perspective of the other who's listening its own perspective. And so it's a kind of split uh, of, uh, the, of the, and that's why uh, judging is, uh, confirms that way of already known. I judge conf in accordingly to what I have, I have already assumed standards of truth, or standards of morals, and so, uh, so I think if the one who is unable to to con to to, wit to bear witness because of uh, this judgment uh, is already uh, he was dislocated from its uh, originary existential position as a as a witness and was uh, was uh, uh, moved to a epistemological position of uh, of the one who is a uh, the judge so the 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 the, the one who who asserts the 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 stable order of things so i think in this way i could uh, i could uh, understand that Witold. Uh, uh, thank you, Christian. Uh, great talk. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I'm just wondering whether you consider also a situation of, a, uh, of an event which is not overwhelming. So event that is not overwhelming. Uh, so I see a crime, but I do not comprehend yeah. it <coughs> as a crime. So yeah. I'm not aware that it was yeah. a crime. So mm -hmm. Hitchcock movie, for example, mm -hmm. uh, the same situation. So only later I am asked what uh, I, uh, I have seen in the past. So the structure, the temporal structure, so I became a witness without being aware that I'm becoming a witness. So I bear uh, a testimony, but at the same time I, I do not bear. So your perspective, I would uh, call it uh, its internet, uh, uh, um, M more internal perspective, but uh, this somehow changes the, the temporal horizon, so it's rather external. So I'm a nurse, so mm -hmm. can you imagine that you are, you know, past president of the US, and someone said that you commit a crime, and you said no, and they asked your uh, lawyer whether he received money. Yeah, he received money, but this was not a crime, yeah. so I witnessed given a money to me, but this was not a crime. Yeah, he, yeah. he simply gave me the money. So, mm -hmm. so the, the, the temporal structure is completely different. Yeah, indeed. Uh, what you uh, mentioned is um, a case uh, privileged by the, uh, there's a long literature on the epistemology of testimony. It's a field in the analytic philosophy, uh, starting from David Hume and Thomas Reid. Uh, if uh, the testimony of others it's a reliable source of knowledge. So somebody told me, you see, there is a broken glass on the other side of the door. And they are uh, discussing this, uh, detailing a lot. It's a huge uh, library, entire library about that. But uh, this is episte uh, the epistemology of, of, of testimony. But my, my, uh, my uh, not thesis, but my uh, presupposition is that phenomenology of witnesses, of witnessing, the phenomenological approach is not, cannot be reduced to that uh, concrete, irrelevant cases. 
So you tell me, you know, I have something, something in my pocket, and you're, I, since I have no experience of what is in your packet, I must accept you as a testimony of your own uh, uh, having in a pocket. But I think phenomenology, uh, for, uh, for phenome uh, testimony is, is relevant, and witnessing is, is relevant for phenomenology only if the event is a, uh, an event that uh, troubles the, st the structure of subjectivity. If not, it's not a phenomenological topic. It's not uh, relevant for us. And uh, also, uh, I think, so, uh, uh, why you need to have an excessive event? Because only an excessive event can, can be negative, a violent one, can be a positive. The conversion of, of Paul the Apostle on the Damascus. He was stunned. I was, uh, something appeared to me. And uh, the, the process of regaining the words, three days he hadn't spoken. So it's, uh, this, uh, the, the event should not be reduced to a uh, 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 violent, a negative possibility. Also a positive, uh, a radical transformation of myself can be through an event. And uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, so I understand the testimony as a, so to say, a saturated phenomenon, a, a, a saturated phenomen phenomenon, not a minimalistic, uh, concrete, uh, uh, ba uh, ban the banality of phenomena. This is not, uh, not stimulating for phenomenology. But, uh, the, the topic can be closed in uh, three lines or four pages, and that's all. The topic is relevant if the subjectivity is unsettled, the discourse, the relation to the other, because uh, uh, you don't have like that in, uh, in cases like epistemological anchor case cases. You don't have that unsettling of the experience. So it's not, so I would say that uh, phenomenologists should address witnessing as an existential phenomenon, not an epistemological topic. And of course, you start from the uh, from the saturated phenomena, and you can modulate it in various constants uh, to a more mundane phenomena. More, but I think you need to start from high to to um, up to down to in this. Thank you. Oh, there's another question. Yes, uh, th thank you for this very interesting uh, reflection on temporality of testimony or of witness. This is a very, for me, is a very important. Uh, but, but my question is is very general. Um, how how does this uh, temporality of witnessing influence our understanding of history? Of history. Or how history is involved in this temporalization? Because we have in our uh, Slovenia, we we have we have the. The case that the one testimony has changed, has provoked to the fall, the fall of, of a communist regime, for example. Yeah. So there is a certain connection. Yeah. Of course, there is a sedimentation of testimony in archives. What Paul Ricoeur says about the, uh, the testimony as the source of the source of. Uh, of, uh, of uh, historical understanding, the testimonies, the, all, all the artifacts can be understood as testimony of what some happened. You see, even if you see, a, 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 a archaeologists can find things that are then reconstructed as, as a testimony. You can find uh, texts that are, can be reinterpreted as testimonies and can be, uh, uh, can be used for the historians. But uh, I think um, uh, there is also a debate between uh, uh, the, uh, among the, um, the field of memory studies uh, uh, anchored in the testimonies, the sub subjective testimony of, of uh, presence of oneself, showing oneself in what one, uh, one have lived, and uh, the historical uh, uh, the historical rigor, you know, that uh, episode on the uh, Dori Laub uh, about the chimneys and the Auschwitz, and she remembered uh, uh, what, what a witness remembered that was uh, burned, uh, was uh, exploded uh, three chimneys, and there were only one. And historians said, this, historians said, no, this it's unreliable. 
and uh, was a conflict between the, the historicist position that need to be attestation epistemically, epistemologically anchored and the subjective uh, ex exhibition of, of, of one's own experience. It was a conflicting, uh, conflicting position there. And uh, I think uh, they are the, the, the historical, the historical uh, sources uh, they have to deal with testimony, without, but not only with testimonies. And some historians try to uh, uh, eliminate testimonies from their own sources. Some other accept them as a possible, fallible, even. But fallibility is also epistemological perspective, not an existential one. So thank you very much for your lecture, and thank you for the questions.